Lucy McLean's journey in Amazon's Fallout series is downright decent television, and a lot of what makes it so watchable for me is watching the character of Lucy McLean go through the tried and true steps of a hero or heroine's journey, a formula that recent Hollywood and particularly Disney seem determined to ruin as much as is humanly possible. It's so easy. Give us the audience a talented individual who means well and is convinced they know what is what and watches their talents and sense of goodwill are tested as they face up to the hard truths surrounding them, growing as they come into conflict with these problems. My mind immediately drifted to the worst example of Hollywood absolutely ruining this type of narrative journey in the absolute mess that surrounds Ray Palpatine. But at the same time, contrasting Ray and Lucy made me realize where I'd seen Lucy McLean's journey before. A certain kid from Tatooine. Luke longs to leave the most boring job description created in the history of fiction, Humidity Farmer, escapes to find himself on something that is definitely not a moon, where he kisses his sister, escapes from his murderous father by running away on the instructions of a space ghost. The transformation from Humidity Farmer and serial wop rat killer to Sister Kisser and Moon Destroyer isn't the full story though, as the metal endowed Luke begins the second film laden with an ego that the narrative must now destroy by means of a literal philosophical muppet, of both his own misunderstanding of his abilities to confront his nemesis and what that nemesis even is in the first place. By the end of the final film, Luke, abandoned by the death of said Muppet and without any friends around him, will finally go on to become a hero, not because he is endowed with a metal or force powers, but because he has a realistic and mature understanding of the relevant facets of his situation, and is able to respond to them as his ethical instructors, Space Ghost and Muppet, would have told him without them needing to give him explicit guidance. He can only stand up to his father and defeat Palpatine because of the ethical character he has built up, not his superpowers. There's a whole other video to be made on how modern Star Wars and Ray Palpatine completely inverts this formula and ruins literally everything, but I'm saving that video for something in the future, so like and subscribe if you want to see it. By contrast, the Fallout TV show hits these narrative story beats perfectly, but with a few nice new twists. Lucy longs to, despite her strong individual abilities, become a parody of a 1950s housewife. She's freed in a very different way than Luke is when his step-parents find themselves on the wrong end of blast marks that are too accurate for sand people. The show plays very well off the 1950s elements, liberating her from her role as a 50s housewife when the vault is attacked by raiders. At this point, it's probably worth mentioning how the show's take on feminism is somewhat unique in modern media at least. I've had comments on my previous video from people saying the show is either disgustingly political to people telling me that the show wasn't feminist or female women centric at all. In my mind, the fact that the comment section looks like that is pretty much a good thing and I think it stems from the way the show was written. The show uses feminist themes. Despite the fact that Lucy has all these talents, she still views the greatest contribution she can make to the human race as being a baby factory, and she finally will get to use those talents as she emerges from the vault onto the surface. The show works for me because it takes the themes of feminism and uses them to tell a story, as opposed to using a story to tell us about the themes and issues of feminism. This is one of the few Hollywood shows in recent times to do this successfully. For example, I'm by no means a Marxist, but I can enjoy Marxist cinema when it tells a good story, and I think the majority of the human race is much more like me than what Twitter, Slash Poll, or Hollywood would tell you. But it is actually the moral conflicts of the show, something many reviewers have in fact criticized, that really makes the show work so well, nothing to do with its social commentary. Lucy, when she finds herself on the surface, tries to use her abilities at every point to apply the moral logic of the vaults to the surface world. As she grows, she realizes this black and white naive approach simply will not work and that the variety of moral situations she finds herself in on the surface cannot be reduced to the ones in the vault. Before I go on though, I want to mention a comment I had on my last video where someone asked me why I think Lucy is the main character of the show. Now, there's a lot of reasons I think this is pretty obviously the case for the simple fact that this is Fallout and she is the titular vault dweller, the protagonist of all the games that aren't titled New Vegas. But there's another more important reason I think it is correct to see the narrative as centered around the development of her character, and that is the relationship between her, Maximus, and Coop. They represent both sides of good and evil, black and white dichotomy, with Maximus being her literal knight in shining armor and Coop being a, well, cannibalistic mercenary ghoul. But in reality, these assumptions are entirely false. The dichotomy is just a cozy fiction. Maximus is an idiot savant who only looks like a knight in shining armor because of a combination of dumb luck and cynical opportunism. Coop looks like a bad guy, but only because he's one of the few people around morally aware of the complexities of their situation and its causes. When all is revealed, his motives are not really all that different from Lucy's. He's just willing to go much further to achieve them. 
a fact that Lucy herself will now have to contend with as the story nears its end. Both Maximus and Coop allow for Lucy's character to grow into the heroine of the story by taking this abstract dichotomy between her naive sense of good and evil and applying that to real people with real flaws united in their pursuit of the show's MacGuffin. This is simple writing indeed, but that makes it all the more surprising how absolutely poor much of Hollywood's writing has become. Now, this is clearly not a difference in personnel or skill. The writer's room for The Follow Show is a who's who of your standard Hollywood writing staff, with Geneva Robert Ward of Captain Marvel fame as lead writer and producer. Now, this is speculation on my behalf, but I suspect the difference in the writing here is actually down to Jonathan Nolan's previously work on the Batman series, alongside the influence of Todd Howard as executive producer, keeping the show in line with, as much as is humanly possible, the style and ethos of the Fallout series. This seems to have had the effect of reining in some of the worst tendencies of modern Hollywood writing. A lot of these issues are also improved by the performances of the cast, in particular Ella Purnell, who has also voiced Jinx in Netflix's Arcane, which was an amazing show in and of itself, and her performance is great throughout the Fallout TV show itself. Also, unlike a lot of lead roles these days, much like Henry Cavill, you can feel that she doesn't come to the IP with her own set of negative assumptions about the very audience she's performing for and having to deal with the world's biggest threat to national security, gamers. Something that's been one of the negative Hollywood trends we've seen all too often lately. There is a moment near the end of the film where Lucy totally caps a ghoul of some importance in the head in a way that so perfectly demonstrates her transformation as a character and, in turn, shows this formula of writing never really gets old. Fans of the franchise do not come to identify or care about characters because you give them shiny superpowers at every turn in the story. That's not character progression, even if those powers literally break the entire world's lore like they did with Ray Palpatine. Iron Man is not beloved because of the suit. This kind of storytelling can work in something like Dragon Ball Z, where watching a hero make bigger and bigger explosions can drive narrative and character development, but it's a sign of how bad Hollywood writing has become that they seem to consistently apply this narrative style that was designed for children's cartoons to the content they make for adults. The Fallout show is good because it isn't watered down in this way. You can deal with Cormac McCarthy-esque themes while dealing with stim packs and power armor. There's no contradiction implicit in being serious about these topics, and every time major studios allow a director to get serious about those topics, whether it's the Dark Knight trilogy or Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, they tend to find success. In the end, and I dealt with this in my previous video which I'll link below, just because something is a computer game or a fantasy novel doesn't mean it needs to be handled with kid gloves. There's nothing cringe or wrong about taking stem packs, power armor, and ghouls seriously. And the Fallout show shows that when you do, you can create an engaging narrative. Fallout gives me hope that after the failure of franchises like The Witcher, we might actually just get a good old hero heroine series that relies on solid traditional storytelling and appealing to its obvious audience and demographic rather than trying to actively alienate that fan base to create a new one out of thin air. It's not hard. Hollywood just needs to stop navel gazing and care more about the response of audiences than access journalists and hedge funds. Peace.